Ah, and we are live! Welcome back to Takes by Fans. we got a great show for you today. As always, we are live every single day at noon Eastern. If you want to watch live, head over to twitch.tv slash Takes by Fans. If you want to watch but not live, head over to our YouTube channel, Takes by Fans. We post all of our shows and clips of the show there on a daily basis. And if you just want to listen, we are on podcasting apps, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, iHeartRadio. So however you want to watch or listen, we've got you covered multiple ways. Alrighty, today is a big all April Fool's Thursday. Have you gotten fooled already? Because I, I I didn't get totally fooled, but I got I I woke up, checked my Twitter feed this morning, and I saw you know breaking news: the Bears trade for Russell Wilson, and it got me for a second. I'm not gonna lie, I'm not gonna pretend like I'm foolproof of April Fool's jokes. I saw it, my heart sunk a little bit, but then I kind of remembered. It took me a second, but uh, for the second they got me. So uh, I'm sure uh, you all have also experienced something like that today or maybe will experience like that because we still got hours left on um, April Fool's Day it's only noon Eastern so uh, let's just say April Fool's has just begun, shall we? Uh, so we'll be uh, breaking down the NBA today on the show, as always. We'll finally, I, we are, I'm, I'm putting it down, we are going to be looking at Michael Carter, the running back from UNC today. We've been pushing him back and back and back because we haven't been able to fit him into uh, the show, but we are going to make the time today. We are going to be finally looking at this man. Um, and then, um, yeah, that's pretty much it. And then we also have to be on the lookout for Michael Strahan. We are looking for that gap to come back, folks. We got a couple of hours left. We got 12 hours left for that gap to come back so uh we are expect <laughs> we are expecting the gap to make a return here today um alrighty so that's what we got on the show let's get it started here with the stories of the day and we kind of touched on this one a little bit at the end of the last night uh, yesterday's show because it was kind of breaking when we were talking about it but uh Seahawks are giving wide receiver Tyler Lockett a four-year 69 million dollar contract extension including 37 million dollars guaranteed absolutely deserved man Russell Wilson I mean he doesn't need these great elite weapons but every wide receiver he gets I mean like instantly looks real good DK Metcalf's working out very well Tyler Lockett's obviously been working out very well for how long is he been there uh since 2015 yes sir so i mean these last two seasons have had a thousand yard season so i mean that's great he's getting the most targets he's getting the most receptions he's ever had in his career here and uh he's really just kind of being a big time wide receiver i mean the last three seasons he had 965 yards for 10 touchdowns uh 1057 yards for eight touchdowns and then just this season 1054 yards for 10 touchdowns so yes give me that as a wide receiver sure hands look at this catch percentage oh my god I don't know if we've ever seen catch percentage this consistently high folks we'll go all the way back to his first year 2015 73% catch percentage fantastic that's absolutely magnificent if you're above 70 that's where we want you to be he's at 73.9 then um, you know 2016 2017 those were his worst year 62% catch percentage then 63 but then he never looked back after those kind of two down years uh, 2018, 81 catch percentage. Holy moly. Then 2019, 74 uh, catch percentage. And then just this year, 75% catch percentage. So, yes, man, sure hands. He can get wide open, no problem. And, I mean, this could, this man could truly be a number one wide receiver on any team, but he doesn't have to be because he's got DK Metcalf. So, Tyler Lockett could theoretically be the number two wide receiver on, your, on this squad. And uh, you're going to have your second corner guard this Tyler Lockett man who's got sure hands hands come on so absolutely great extension here I've got no problem I've been seeing oh everybody's saying he's overpaid no he's not you've got Russell Wilson you need to make him happy we've already seen him kind of starting talking out of line a little bit which is a little unusual we've never seen Russell Wilson criticize Pete Carroll or the organization or the Seattle franchise at all but now he's got clout he's like yeah I'm actually really freaking good pay me my respect pay me my dues or I'm gonna start going after everybody's heads here and um so I don't know if uh, him kind of, you know, talking about, you know, Pete Carroll and the Seattle organization uh, kind of led to this extension. We know he wants kind of beefy line so, you know, he doesn't get hit anymore. That was kind of his main point that he was pointing out. But uh, making uh, Russell Wilson a little bit happy now. Got actually great wide receiver secured for this season. Now let's look for Seattle to do something about that line in this draft this season and make Russell Wilson very, very happy. Alrighty, and man, oh man, I, oh man, I, 
I, I, I think I'm going to become a Bucks fan, folks. I think I'm going to be rooting for the Bucks next season. I just absolutely love it. When everybody puts money aside and just wants to win and go after championships and wants to create something, create a long-lasting legacy, create a dynasty in this league to be forever cemented in the legacy. So in, you know, uh, 250 years where takes by fans is still on the air, but it's not me because I'm dead and somebody else has to take over. They're like, man, oh man, that Bucks team uh, 150 years ago was absolutely crazy, man. Uh, so <clears throat> that's what they're trying to build here in the Bucks because Leonard Fournette, this is why he he tells us why he chose the Bucks over all these other teams. Leonard Fournette chose Bucks reunion over, quote, more money elsewhere because, quote, this team kind of humbled me. I mean, Leonard Fournette was almost not quite out of this league. I mean, he he had that great season with the Jags, but then kind of, you know, his production kind of started to decline a little bit. The Bucks took a chance on him, really revitalized his career a little bit, got it done in the playoffs, got it done even better in the Super Bowl, and now this man's kind of back to RB1 almost behind, you know, Jones, Ronald Jones that they have, but I mean... He stays here to build this dynasty. We've been seeing all these re-signings by the Bucs. Obviously, Tom Brady, Gronk, the defense, uh, and Dominican Sue. Uh, Chris Godwin got tagged, but they're bringing everybody back because everybody's like, we want to win rings, man. We got Tom Brady. We got one of the greatest quarterbacks of all time who just literally switched from a 20-year team that he's been on to a new team and an instantly won. I think I'm going to stick around for at least probably two more seasons, at least one more season. Let's go back-to-back, -back, and then I can go hunt for money after this man's retired and I don't have to worry about playing against this man anymore to because he's a roadblock of me getting a ring so let me just team up with the roadblock get my rings and then when it's all over I'll go get paid because now I got three rings you don't think somebody's gonna overpay for a man that's got three rings and a lot of leadership hey I play I play with Tom Brady I can bring that experience to the team but I'm gonna need 75 million right <laughs> right quick so uh, I love it I absolutely love it everybody's being unselfish here everybody just wants to win everybody just wants to get rings and hey you know it when you're playing pro sports, it's either about winning or the money. And hey, like I said, I, I don't know what I would do in that situation when I'm truly kind of faced with, hey, you could have, have an extra probably $25 million or you can try to compete for a ring. I really don't know which one I would do. I, I, I'm assuming it would take like... I'm assuming, uh, you know, where I am currently in my career plays a lot into it. You know, if I've been in the league forever and I've never won a ring, but I've been decently paid, I think I'm going for the ring. Or if I just started out, I'm like, hey, let me get this money real quick and then I'll worry about rings a little bit later. So I, it's just great that everybody just wants to play and just wants to win for this Bucks team. Bruce Aarons is getting tatted up left and right now. Uh, Tom Brady is throwing Lombardi trophies over boats and stressing out Karens all over the world. And now we get Leonard Fournette back in action as well here. Love it. Alrighty, next up, and oh man, oh man, yes sir, Taylor Heineke wants the competition, yes sir. So we all know Taylor Heineke was kind of the number one quarterback in Washington this season um, over Dwayne Haskins, obviously, and over Alex Smith, who they've gotten rid of now. Uh, but then they brought in Ryan Fitzpatrick, the career backup man that's got his own magic nickname and, you know, making everybody not want to play Tua, getting all the Dolphins fans crazed up. So now he's in Washington, and Taylor Heineke, he's about the competition, so here we go. Quote by Taylor Heineke. Taylor Heineke on competition with Ryan Fitzpatrick. Quote, it's going to be a fun battle. Yes, sir. I love that. Taylor Heineke not shying away. Not being like, oh, you know, I was here last season and I did good. So I should just automatically be the starter. This man wants the competition. Wasn't he in like the AFL? That's how he got noticed. And then he got brought up to Washington and almost beat Tom Brady. I don't think we speak enough about that. This man almost had to had beat Tom Brady almost uh, in the first round of the playoffs. Brought it to um, the last drive in the fourth quarter. Just couldn't finish. And, you know, that's... That's fine. Taylor Heineke, brand new in this league. I can cut him a little bit of slack losing against one of the greatest of all times. Um, so absolutely magnificent. I truly want Taylor Heineke to win the competition. I love Ryan Fitzpatrick. Don't get me wrong. I mean, I I, I can't thank him enough for what he did for the Dolphins this season and kind of, you know, some great wins. Uh, also some bad losses that we sweep under the rug. A lot of interceptions that we sweep under the rug because he won us some games. So let's praise the man a little bit. Um, but... 
Taylor Heineke and Ryan Fitzpatrick. Ryan Fitzpatrick, he's been here in the league, so I, I, I hope Ron Rivera doesn't kind of, you know, get blinded by that a little bit too much because I do still think Taylor Heineke is the right solution here in Washington, at least for this season. You know, if they want to draft a quarterback and kind of have him kind of just back up and learn for a year, that's fine. Or maybe go after a quarterback hard next year in the draft, that's fine as well. But I definitely want to see Tyler he Taylor Heineke get his true shot, one true chance, not last season where, you know, he uh, he didn't start. I think Dwayne Dwayne Haskins started, Dwayne Haskins started, then he was trash, and then they brought in Taylor Heineke, but then Alex Smith was good to go, so they put in Alex Smith, and then he wasn't really getting it done, so they're like, all right, we'll try to Dwayne Haskins again, and they're like, no, 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 we're not doing that again after one series on the field, and then they bring in Taylor Heineke, and he was like, all right, we got to work with this man, this man's doing good, being solid, winning us games, so we can't be mad at the man, so truly want this man to get his full shot here, going against Ryan Fitzpatrick, it's going to be tough, because this man's obviously been in the league forever as a backup and has made a career as a backup and that's not a knock I mean to be a one of the greatest backups of all time that's pretty dang good um so just want to have a fair competition here and I'm I'm rooting for Heineke in this one obviously you know Ryan Fitzpatrick should be the backup no doubt but uh, I want to see this man get his shot and let's see what this man can do all righty we've been following this man for Basically, ever since, you know, we've been talking about the draft because this man's going to be absolutely fantastic. And now he's even believing in himself. So you get a great specimen athletic wise. We just saw him break the record for the wingspan that DK Metcalf just held. And this man's a tight end. We just saw this man run a 4 4 40. Absolutely wild. And we all know what he can do on the field because we've been watching this man from Florida. I mean, he's going to be the best wide receiving tight end possibly ever to play the game. And he even believes in himself here. So, ahead of 2021 NFL draft tight end Kyle Pitts foresees greatness quote I feel like I can be the best to ever do it I mean woohoo this man's got great goals man he wants to be the greatest of all time he wants to be the best tight end of all time and I mean you know the competition that he's going against you know his first year in the league Travis Kelsey George Kittle uh Darren Waller who's basically you know Kyle Pitts before Kyle Pitts but Kyle Pitts says got a little he's kind of building on what Darren Waller is he's got the better wingspan I think he runs a little bit quicker than Darren Foles, Darren uh, Foles does. Uh, but yeah, Kyle Pitts going to be absolutely magnificent here. I mean, he's got all the tangibles. We've seen him play. He's got great hands. He's, uh, I, I, I don't know. I, I think I'm going to be afraid if he doesn't go to the Dolphins because I don't want to have to face this man ever. I don't want to have to watch this man not be on my team. That's how great this man's going to be. And he's even believing in himself and he's got high goals. So man, oh man, watch out for Kyle Pitts, man. I know it's going to be tough to kind of draft a tight end and high up in that draft so we'll see where he goes but whoever gets this man you got to watch out for this team honestly it's going to get it's going to get nuts it's uh, let's just say that whatever whatever team Kyle Pitts gets on their offense is going to be absolutely nuts it's going to be almost unguardable at this point uh so I don't know man I don't know how you're going to stop Kyle Pitts but mm, he's not going to stop he's not going to stop the man wants to be the goaded so Alrighty, uh, the uh, there's a couple of uh, proposed rule changes uh, up on the discussion, up for discussion on the ballot on the docket today for the competition committee. So let's see what we got here. Any great rules that we kind of agree with? Let's see what they're proposing and let's see what's potentially potentially coming to the NFL. So during upcoming owners meeting, clubs will vote on the following proposed rule changes. All proposals must be approved by 75%, that's 24 of the owners, uh, to be adopted. NFL clubs will consider and vote on the following competition committee and club submitted proposals. So here we go. These are the competition committee proposed rules. So the first one, let's see, to eliminate overtime in the preseason. Yes, that's got to be abolished. I mean, we don't even want preseason season anymore we added an extra game it took away a preseason game so let's stop with the preseason a little bit I understand that we do need the preseason we do need the preseason to get kind of you know the final rosters who's going to have that last opportunity to prove themselves who can actually play on the field because we've been doing training camps and OTAs and y'all are looking good but now we're going to throw you into some game time situations we need you out there we need to see what you can do show us all that you have lay it all out there you got three games to do it and there's no overtime so you better hope you win 
out quick because we're not giving you those, those extra minutes on the field. So, yes, definitely got to eliminate the overtime in preseason. It doesn't matter. Who cares if you die in preseason? It literally means zero, zero. We're just trying to see what our players can do. And, I mean, you know, starters – you know, how they kind of play the the preseason. They don't even start to like week three, that third preseason game. And they'll play like maybe the first quarter. And then the fourth preseason game, you know, they play a little bit more, maybe the first, second, possibly a little bit of the third. They're not playing the entire game. So yeah, I've got no problem eliminating preseason games. I would say at least keep two preseason games. I think they can cut it down to two. Um, we just saw the uh, there was no preseason this year because of the COVID and I, I would say that the season went off without a hitch and you know I think the best team in the end won and I really don't think like any team really struggled those first kind of four weeks let's just say you know a, a great team that should have like been in the playoffs like lost four games and just couldn't get back on track at the end of the season I think everybody in the playoffs this season truly deserved to be there and everybody else that didn't make it I don't think you know not having that preseason floundering for the first two weeks helped Held them back any in the record department so I've got no problem eliminating preseason games or this kind of new rule uh, eliminate overtime in preseason that's fantastic Alrighty, rule number two by the competition committee. Here we go. For one year only to establish a maximum number of players in the setup zone. Mm, okay. I mean, one year experiments. I, I'm not a big fan of them. We just had the one with the replay review just because it, it, it puts a it doesn't put a like uh, an uh, like an asterisk next to that season, meaning like it shouldn't count. But it does kind of you know have to you know when we're looking back at players and what they're actually do. Like if they had great in that 2019 season because of that pass interference replay rule, but then they struggle every time else. I mean, it could get buried of why some teams are good and why some players are good, and maybe why some players had some inflated seasons. Uh, so I'm not a big fan of like let's try this out for one year. Not a big fan of that. Um, but to establish the maximum numbers number of players in a setup zone. I don't even know what that means, honestly. <laughs> I think that's got to be something about um, um, kickoff. Interesting. Free kick formation. Yeah, that's what it's about. So um, I, I, I don't care about that. Um, whatever. Do that. I don't care. I don't care about the kickoff. It's always a touchback. That's what they want to do. So let them do it. Okay, here we go. Rule number three. To expand the prohibition of blocking below the waist by offensive and defensive players on scrimmage downs when contact occurs beyond five yards on either side of the line of scrimmage and more than two yards outside of the either tackle box. So to expand ban the prohibition of blocking below the waist. I mean, just trying to make the game a little bit safer there. No more chop blocks, you know, going at the knees. No, no, no. So, yeah, I've got no problem with that if they want to do that. Just expanding it further. Every way of the field, up, down, left, right. Uh, so that's fine. And then the last rule uh, submitted here. Um, here we go. By competition committee coaches and Baltimore to amend Rule 15, Section 3, Article 9, and Rule 19, Section 2, 2. Permit the replay official and designated members of the officiating department to provide certain objective information to the on-field officials. To provide certain objective information. So the replay's got some information, some objective information that they want to relay to on-field officials. All righty. Now, this is – I don't really truly know how I feel about this. I feel like I want – like I want all the I want all the calls to be fair and go both ways. Uh, it's hard to do that with player with coaches on the field. That's why you know they've kind of been having this big old replay center one replay center where everybody's in here, all the kind of the replay officials in this kind of one centralized location looking at everything going on. I think that's going to be a little bit more towards what the NFL is going to go to. I mean, we're talking years down the road, I think. Uh, but just having kind of like uh, you know, sky, sky referees, you know, centralized referees that can just see all the games and see everything, all the viewpoints from kind of a, um, a backed up point of view and overhead point of view. So it's tough, you know, do we leave them all on the field or do we kind of have, you know, we've got what they're seeing on the field, but then we've also got, you know, kind of this other centralized, um, unobjective observer from all this other place, you know, communicating back and forth. This is what we saw, but that's what we saw over here, but this is what we saw on the field, which one, you know, has the final rule. So I think that's where it can get a little muddy when you've got two different things, just kind of relaying information, who's going to have that final judgment call. So, um, I don't even know what this rule is going to be all about 
to permit rule officials. I don't know, understand what the objective information that they're going to be cross referencing with each other. I don't understand what that's going to be. Uh, so I guess we'll stay away from commenting any further on this rule. I don't know. <laughs> uh, all right, let's go to these club playing rule proposals. So these are by teams, what they want to kind of propose to the NFL. So hopefully these are a little bit more, we can talk about a little bit more in depth here. So here we go. Uh, seven rules here. The first one by Chicago. To ensure the enforcement of all accepted penalties committed by either team during successive try attempts. So, okay, on a field goal try, having all accepted penalties committed by either team during successive try. So, not no, any cancellation like that. Uh, so, maybe, you know, you get an offsides, but then you get roughing the kicker. So, you know, it's five yards for offsides, 15 yards for roughing the kicker, and then that's a 10-yard penalty. Is that what they're trying to get? Um um, we, uh, you know, obviously, you know, if there's more than one penalty by either team, they all offset. So it seems like the Chicago wants to erase that for kicking tries, field goal tries, all that. Um, it doesn't seem that bad. It doesn't seem game breaking. So yeah, I don't care, you know, implement the rule. I don't think that would be detrimental to the game. I don't even think it would be used that much either. <laughs> Um, all right, here we go. Rule number two by the Rams, introduced by the Rams here, to add a loss of down for a second forward pass behind the line and for a pass thrown after the ball returns behind the line. So they want to just make that a loss of down I've to add a loss of down. I've got no problem with that. You know, forward passes, illegal passes, got no problem with that to adding a loss of down um, on top of that. All right, okay. Uh, rule number three here by Kansas City to expand jersey number options for certain positions. Okay, all right. Kansas City's worried about what jersey their players are wear. Their, their, what jersey their players are wearing. All these other ones are like, hang on, we want to, you know, an X. We want more penalties on the kickoff or on these field goals, or you know, we want loss of downs with forward passes. And Kansas City's like, we want our linebacker to wear number one, please. <laughs> all right, I've got. I, I truly don't care about that. I think it's a little weird anyway. That kind of, uh, you know. Certain players have to wear certain numbers or certain positions have to wear certain numbers. I get it. I think it makes it a little bit easier for kind of scoring and box scoring and for the judges and for the referees on the field. I think that's the reason for the rule. But, yeah, I've got no problem with having, you know, whoever you want out there, whatever number you want, go out and get it. I don't care. All righty. Rule number four by Baltimore and Philadelphia. To change the options for winner of an overtime coin toss and create a true sudden death format. Um, so that's I think this is the rule they're talking about here. Ravens are proposing a spot and choose format for overtime. So this is how it works. One team would pick the spot of the ball, which yard line, uh, for the start of OT. Then the other team would decide based on that spot whether they want to play offense or defense. So the coin toss is tossed. Somebody calls heads. It's heads. They win the coin toss so they can be like, like, all right, we want to place the ball on the 50-yard line. And then the other team was like, all right, we'll take the offense on the 50. Or we'll take the defense trying you know, trying to stop them on the 50-yard line for scoring potential. So that's definitely interesting. Kind of, you know, this is kind of like um, the game where, hey, uh, uh, you know, I can guess the song in four notes. No, I can guess it in three notes. So you're kind of, you know, betting on yourself a little bit. We're going to start. I want the ball on the five-yard line because I want my offense. I trust my offense on there. And the other team's going to be like, all right, we're putting our defense. You want to start on the five-yard line? Okay, do that so it's gonna that's kind of interesting I'm, I'm definitely down with that concept um definitely making the overtime a little bit more something better than what it is you know just kind of more football you know an extra well i think it's like 12 or 10 minutes uh, time um so definitely got to do something with overtime i think it's definitely lackluster of where it is right now um, so we'll see. I mean, this is definitely an interesting proposal. I, it may be getting a little bit too gimmicky at this point. We'll see what happens. But I think it's definitely an interesting rule to even think about. So I, I appreciate that. Okay, <clears throat> by Baltimore. Here we go. Rule number five to change the options for winner of over for of. Uh, to change the options for winner of an overtime coin toss, eliminate sudden death format, and eliminate overtime in the preseason. Okay, well, I think we just kind of covered some of that with the one that we just read. I'm not really sure what the difference is between number four and five here. So let's just go on to rule number six here. By Philadelphia, to permit a team to maintain possession of the ball after a score by substituting one offensive play 
for an onside kick attempt. So fourth and 15 from the kicking team's 25-yard line. I truly do not like that. I want onside to be a kicking portion again. I don't want it to be, all right, we got fourth and 15. If we pick up the first down, we get the ball again. If we don't, then the, the other team maintains possession right from that start about the 25-yard line. The opponent's 25 yard line. I think I do not like that at all. Kicking has to be another. It's it's the third facet of the game. Offense, defense, special teams. I mean, we. I don't like this new um, onside kick rule that barely ever happens. I really think you should be able to line up however many players you want on either side of the ball because that's that's how you get the onside kick. Tricking the other team. Maybe just kicking one on one on the left side. If the defense puts nobody else on the left side, I'm taking the one on one kick. Just like I take the one on one matchups in the end zone. I'm taking the one-on-one kick because I'm front-loading the right side so that I only got one guy on the left. I'm faking kicking right, kick back left real quick. I'm going to trust my guy to go get it. So I really think they should just make this onside kick rule simple. Line up however many players on whatever side of the ball you want. Kick the onside kick. Whoever gets it, gets it right where it is. I think that's really simple. I think we're going way too wild with, all right, fourth and 15, but no, fourth and 20. No, let's make it fourth and 25. Can you pick up a fourth and 25 offensively? I'm not liking it. I'm not liking it. All right, and then the final rule by Baltimore. Man, Baltimore has got all these rules in place. They're like, please help us out. We cannot beat the Chiefs by ourselves. We need these rules. Uh, so by, Barth by Baltimore, to add an eighth official who is positioned somewhere other than the playing field with full communication to an on-field official and access to a television monitor. Now, this is kind of what we, what I was a little bit hinting towards, you know, just having this kind of unbiased, obje unobjective outside observer monitoring the entire game, seeing what's going on, relaying it to, you know, the centralized location of the NFL replay, having, you know, on field contact with the other referees. I don't think it's a bad idea. We just can't, because then you're going to start calling, all right, well, that's a hold because I see it clearly. Uh, you know, every play is holding, you understand? So I, I think it might get a little bit too ticky tacky if it's like one person having full advantage a full view of the on field of what's happening because he can see everything and there's you know there's penalties on every single play it's just like which ones are the most egregious so if we can all agree that we can have one kind of bird's eye view but we're not calling the you know the the little ticky tacky calls we're just calling the most egregious ones then I can get behind it a little bit but I think if we're getting all this input from all, all these kind of people here then we're gonna get way too many penalties everything's ticky tacky can't do anything anymore <clears throat> Um, all right, so those are some of the proposed rule changes that we could potentially see. I don't know which ones are going to get passed. I'm, I'm not a big fan of any of these. It's not like, oh, my goodness, this rule makes the NFL, it makes football a thousand times better. Um, just kind of, you know, subtle rule attempts, subtle rule changes. Uh, don't really have any too big of problems with any either one of these. So we'll see what happens. We'll keep you guys updated on which ones get passed and which ones don't to get us all ready for the 2021 20, season because that's all we want. Who cares about the rules? We'll play with no rules. No rules. No rule football. Put all 52 players on the field. We don't care. Score. Go ahead. <laughs> uh, so, uh, yeah, like we said, uh, we'll see what happens on these rules. All righty, let's move on. Okay, Adam Schefter, a little tweet out here. Do the Jets ticket department know something others don't, question mark? All right, so here we go. On the Jets um, kind of season ticket holder kind of portion of the website, they got Sam Darnold out right front and center, right in your face, hey, Come, come, come to the Jets Stadium this season because you're going to see Sammy D in action, baby. Um, so a little interesting here. We've been kind of hearing about a little rumors that the Jets are going to be drafting a quarterback at number two. They've got their pick of the crop. I mean, besides Trevor Lawrence, they can choose whoever quarterback they want. Or do they stick with Sam Darnold? So that's kind of what we are unknown about. Or maybe the 49ers also know because this could also kind of back up what the 49ers just did. Why would the 49ers kind of jump in the draft so high and sell out first round picks and the next couple of years of drafts if they know that the Jets are going to draft a quarterback. So I think I'm ready to kind of solidify that the Jets are going to stick with Sam Darnold. Have Robert Sala have a kind of, he's not a veteran quarterback, but you know, he's not a rookie. He's not his first year in. This is going to be his fourth season, fourth season, third or fourth season playing. So yeah, I mean, you don't really want a new rookie quarterback with a new rookie head coach that's never been a head coach any uh, before. So I think, I think the Jets are going to stick with Sam Darnold here. Um, 
just kind of based on uh, what the 49ers did and having Robert Sala. I'm not putting too much weight on this kind of uh, ticket uh, website here for the Jets just because we just saw the Seahawks send out their um, season ticket holder letter and their kind of brochure, the, get it, the hype package we'll call it, uh, to the season ticket holders and they didn't include Russell Wilson. And we're all pretty much sure by now that Russell Wilson is going to stay a Seahawk. So I don't think this ticket page has too much kind of weight in whether Sam Darnold is there or not. But I think with the 49ers moving up to number three, they kind of understand that the Jets are not taking quarterback. And from the from the aspect of they have a rookie head coach in Robert Sala, let's get them a veteran kind of quarterback that can, you know, no, help them out. Help each other learn. Help each other grow. Help each other at the quarterback and head coach position. Just kind of be solid for this year. Uh, so once again, I mean, we'll keep an eye on Sammy D, whether he stays here or if they get draft or if the Jets draft a quarterback. But uh, um, I, I would say both options are. I, I would. I would. I'm leaning towards 60% keeping Sam Darnold. Maybe no 70. 70% keeping Sam Darnold. 30% drafting a quarterback. But uh, hey, we'll see. We're going live draft night, April 29th, a half hour before the draft. That's when we'll start our show at twitchtv fans If you want to watch. All righty, Justin Fields. He's getting a little big for his britches here. I think just a little bit. The man's not already in the league yet, and the man is kind of you know. Talking himself up a little bit, getting maybe buying the hype. We just saw his pro day the other day. It was pretty good, making some nice throws, deep balls, absolutely fantastic. He kind of made the same throw that everybody was going wild that Zach Wilson made as well. And maybe even a little deeper on the same throw. But uh, Justin Fields says he's different than the other Ohio State QBs. Quote, in all honesty, I think I'm different than those guys. Because we've seen, you know, some decent play by Ohio State quarterbacks in the recent years. But they never pan out in the NFL. The latest example is Dwayne Haskins. Not great. Really not great. So we'll, we'll quickly go over what Justin Fields got. I mean, the biggest red flag I have on Justin Fields is that I don't like what he does in kind of the big games. Lots of turnovers are just not showing up to the occasion. So really got the start here in 2019 a little bit. So let's go to what he did in these playoff games, these bowl games in 2019. Uh, first bowl game against Wisconsin. He plays well, you know, three touchdowns, 299 yards, and they get the win. But then they move on to Clemson in 2019, and he flounders, you know, two interceptions, you know, turning the ball over, and then they lose. And it was a one-score game. When did that second interception come? Was it on a potentially game-winning drive? Um, I can't find it out here, but the fact that he threw two interceptions here is not the greatest there. Floundering in the big games, and then just this season. Yes, he got his revenge on Clemson, but we know that Clemson is going down every single year with Trevor Lawrence. I mean, like that first year with Trevor Lawrence was the greatest, but then they've slowly started to decline a little bit. Um, so, uh, here we go, 2020 bowl game against Northwestern, two interceptions, luckily they were able to win, I mean, this was for the Big Ten Conference Championship, and they only put up 22 points, he throws no touchdowns and throws two picks, luckily, you know, Ohio State has a pretty good game, because they've got good running backs, that's why the quarterback stats are a little inflated, because Ohio State has great running backs, we'll get to those in a second, but um, 2020, uh, Trevor Lawrence kind of flounders in the Big Ten Championship, then in the first round of the playoffs against Clemson, he gets his revenge. Six touchdowns, only one pick. Played absolutely great this game. But like we said, Clemson's going down in kind of, you know, status a little bit, value a little bit in the college uh, football. Um, and then just in the championship game against Alabama, oh my goodness, got absolutely smacked. Smacked by Alabama. Um 51% completion percentage. Yeah, he didn't throw any touchdowns, but the man wasn't throwing good. Only 51% throwing. One touchdown, 194 yards, not even 200 yards. So, played his worst game of the season here. <laughs> he played his two worst games. The first one in the Big Ten Championship and the second one in the National Championship. So, uh, you know, his kind of clutch ability is a little bit in question here. Not the greatest. Those are the only red flags I have on this man. But then if we kind of go back to what other kind of quarterbacks he's saying that he's clearly better than, he's not like these other kind of quarterbacks well let's look at Dwayne Haskins he only played one year in Ohio State like one starting year there and he threw 50 touchdowns and only eight interceptions and he didn't even flounder he didn't even flounder in their bowl games in their um um against Northwestern here for the Big Ten Championship they get the win 
He throws five touchdowns, only one pick. Fantastic. Then in the bowl game against Washington, he gets to win again. Three touchdowns, no picks, clean win. So even Dwayne Haskins, who played great in the bowl games, he flou and had a fantastic season. I mean, 50 touchdowns, eight interceptions, absolutely magnificent. Justin Fields threw 41 touchdowns and three interceptions. So Dwayne Haskins a tad little bit better there, but still couldn't make it work in the NFL. Let's go back a little bit further here. JT Barrett. JT Barrett. He was looking pretty good, you know, solid in 2017. 35 touchdowns, 9 interceptions. Let's see what this man did in the bowl games. Um, Big Ten Championship against Wisconsin. They get the win, but once again, he throws two interceptions. And then in the bowl game against Southern California, they get the win. But once again, no touchdowns, only 114 yards. So this goes to the point that Ohio State had great running backs. And who do they have for Dwayne Haskins and Justin Fields and JT Barrett? That J.K. Dobbins, who's making a, a year one impact, a rookie impact on the Ravens. Come on. So this Ohio State franchise here, this Ohio State school, it always kind of depends on the running back a little bit. We can you know, um, even go back to um, Cardell Jones here. When uh, I believe uh, he had Ezekiel Elliott in 2015. And Ohio State was pretty good in 2015. Uh, but Cardell Jones wasn't that great. He wasn't the factor here. Starting quarterback, only 1,400 yards, 8 touchdowns, 5 interceptions. Absolutely not good. Let's see if they won the bowl games in 2015. Thanks to the running backs. Um, did they not even get to a bowl game in 2015? What do they got here? He didn't even play in the bowl game in 2015. <laughs> That's how good this man was not. <laughs> um... What do they do here? What do they do? Um, let me look at the schedules and results here. So 2015 Ohio State got to the bowl game against Michigan. They win it. The Big Ten Championship against Michigan, they win it. And then the bowl game against Notre Dame, they win as well. So once again, just carrying by their running back. So yeah, Justin Fields, you've had a pretty good season. Some red flags. Same thing with all these other kind of good Ohio State quarterbacks that you know are going to definitely be good in this league or kind of you know be solid in the NFL, making that transition from college to the NFL. I'm sorry, Justin Fields. I'm not seeing it. I would not draft the man. I would not draft, draft Justin Fields. Those kind of when he faces the best team he flounders when he faces the best defenses when he's in the championship game he flounders not throwing well the yes, he's not throwing picks but then he does as well in the big 10 championship game i mean your two worst games cannot be against good opponents in a covid season and like uh, like in the big games in the championship games both championship games big 10 and national he flounders the most and uh, the running backs just couldn't help him out in that last game so justin fields you can talk the talk but uh, we have a history here of not great Ohio State quarterbacks in this league. And that, I've got a, just a little bit red flag on this man. Just, just Those are the red flags that I have. And I would not draft him because of those red flags, honestly. But we'll see. Maybe you can prove me, prove me wrong. I would love it. Yes, I want to see great. I want to see everybody be great in this league. I'm not trying to knock anybody. I want to see greatness. I want to see the best going against the best so I know who's, true, who's, who's truly the best. Uh, but I do not think it's going to be just Justin Fields. All right, and then the last story to cover, like we said, we kind of covered this one as well at the end of uh, last night's show because it was kind of breaking when we were talking about it. But uh, former NBA executive on Kemba Walker, quote, they tried in the offseason. He had a few offers on the table and almost pulled the trigger. Kemba is very likely to be on the move this coming offseason. Like we said, I mean, this man's not really contributing to a lot of wins. I really would say if they got rid of Kemba Walker, I don't think their win-loss changes that much. He's kind of the fourth best option on this team. Jason Tatum, Jalen Brown. Uh, um, Marcus Mart. I choose Marcus Smart over Kemba Walker as well. Um, and maybe even Robert Williams because he's <laughs> starting to impress us a little bit more here. So definitely the Celtics are going to be in the market for a nice point guard to kind of put them over the edge. Um, they brought in Evan Fournier. Maybe they're going to kind of transition to him next season, but we just saw him kind of flounder in his first matchup. They just played last night, so we'll see how he played. But um, yeah, just not a big fan of Kemba Walker. He doesn't know how to win consistently. That's kind of our one knock. He was with the you know Charlotte his entire career, never winning, never getting to the playoffs. And the one thing that I really cannot stand about Kemba Walker, and this is just about pure competition, pure competitive standpoint. Every single game they lose, as soon as that buzzer sounds, this man is big old smiles, slapping up everybody, all the superstars on the opposing team, saying great game, great game. Meanwhile, I mean his team just missed like a game winning shot or game winning layup. It doesn't affect him because he doesn't know 
what winning is. So he's all smiles. He's like, yeah, I know we're going to lose. I knew that we were going to lose this game. But, hey, it was great playing with you. That's, that, it irritates me a little bit. And I know it shouldn't. But it does on just kind of competitive standpoint. Because Jason Tatum's like, man, I just dropped 42 points. Kemba Walker, you just went like one of ten from the three. And you're all smiles slapping up everybody else? Trying to get recruited out of here? What are you doing? Like, that's just the one thing. That's the one knock I can't stand on Kemba Walker, honestly. It's it's every single game, folks. If you watch any tele, any game, any game, doesn't even have to be televised or what, NBA uh, League Pass, whatever, every single game, this man, after every single loss, is slapping up everybody. Giant smile on his face. The buzzer just sounded, you just lost by 10 points. You just lost to one of the best teams in the Eastern Conference. And this man's like, hey, great game. Great, uh, like, all right, settle down, settle down. We just fucking lost. What are you doing out here, man? So that's the only knock I have on Kemba Walker. Truly, he's decent. He's good. He's average. Maybe slightly above, slightly above average. Doesn't know how to win games. Alrighty, those are all the stories we needed to cover for today. Uh, let's head over to the NBA. We'll kind of talk about what happened last night in the NBA, do our moneymaker for today's NBA action, and then we'll head over to our NFL draft prospect of the day. So here we go in the NBA. We'll start with game number one here, Blazers and the Pistons, and the Blazers take care of business. Thank goodness I could have not taken another kind of close game for this Pistons team. I'm sick of seeing the Pistons, like, competitive. Um, so, Blazers take care of business, 124-101, so a nice 23-point win. Let's see why. Let's start here with the Blazers. Damian Lillard, yes, sir. Let's start to talk about him in the MVP discussion again. We have we've kind of been taking a week off of talking about Damian Lillard in the MVP because they haven't been winning the games that they needed to. But uh, they get back on track with this nice win by Damian Lillard. 33 points, 10 assists, 4 rebounds on 47% shooting, and 5 of 7 from 3. Dame Dalla is still here, y'all. All righty, CJ McCollum, great game by him as well. 24 points, 6 assists, 3 rebounds, and shot 4 of 8 from 3. So the 3 ball was kind of consistent all throughout. Yusuf Nurchich still healthy in the starting lineup. Still only you know playing 20 minutes, so a little bit on minutes restrictions. But that's alright because you still got Ennis Cantor coming off the bench. That's fantastic. Yusuf Nurchich, 6 points, 4 assists, 6 rebounds, getting it done. Just being that beef down low. Fantastic. Robert Covington, 16 points, 6 rebounds on 75% shooting. Norman Powell, 14 points, 2 blocks, 3 steals, 2 assists, 3 rebounds on 50% shooting. Fantastic. Norman Powell is fitting into this offense perfectly, getting it done on the defensive end while still getting us the 10-plus points that we kind of want from all of our starters. So, very well done. Man, oh, man, I love this Blazers team. Yes, sir. And then off the bench, let's get it done. Yes, sir. Ennis Cantor, 10 points, 8 rebounds. Carmelo Anthony, 16 points, 3 rebounds. All right, let's check in with Derek Jones Jr. here off the bench. 3 points, 4 rebounds, 18 minutes off the bench, a 1-5 to five shooting. So, all righty. He's a solid option here off the bench. He just need. I just want this man to give us 10 points a game. That's all I want to see by this man. But um, not bad by him off the bench. So everything is perfect here for the Blazers. Love this team. Top down. Starters bench. Absolutely fantastic. All righty. And then here we go. The Pistons. Jeremy Grant doing his thing. Trying to will his team to a win. 30 points. Four assists. Two rebounds on 57% shooting. Um, we've got. Oh, my goodness. we got two starters with zero points. Sadiq Bey. Zero points on OVA shooting. Come on, man. Got to be way better than that. Way better. Josh Jackson. Zero points on 0-5 shooting. And then we get Saban Lee. The starting point guard. Two points on 1-4 shooting. So we've got three players in the starting rotation with only two points combined and that is not good at all now they did get some solid uh, contribution off the bench because how can you not with you know three players putting up basically zero points Hamidio Diallo 19.7 rebounds great nice shot 87 percent and uh we get uh, Corey Joseph 11 points nine assists on 50 percent shooting so man oh man gotta get some of these starters out of this lineup here this Pistons team we all know they're not good and that's why that's exactly why we just read it off trash <laughs> trash in that starting lineup <laughs> Alrighty, moving on to the Heat and the Pacers now. This was one of our moneymaker picks. We chose the Heat minus two. Folks, folks, when will y'all realize that we've been telling the truth forever? If they've got Goran Dragic and Jimmy Butler both playing together, they will win the game. They've, they're have they on the two-game winning streak now because Goran Dragic has been in the starting lineup for the last two games. I mean, it's not a coincidence three games ago. Uh, yeah, the three games ago, he was not playing and they lose. And then he just comes in two games ago. They win. 
win. He's back this game. They win. It's not a coincidence. They don't need Victor Oladipo. They need him if they kind of want to compete for a ring, but they don't kind of need him right here in the regular season on kind of, you know, we can kind of win. In a seven-game series, yeah, let me give Victor Oladipo. But as long as you have Jimmy Butler and Goran Dragic, we can take this heat. We can bet the heat. We chose them minus two because we saw Goran Dragic and Jimmy Butler both playing. It's not that they both score 35 points. It's that they know how to facilitate the floor and make players around them better. That's why we need them on the floor. So he's in. They're both in the starting lineup. They win by how many points they win by? Uh, five. Minus two. Perfect. Bingo, bango. No problem. So the Heat stay on track. Nice two-game winning streak uh, brewing. Goran Dragic, 12 points, 2 assists, 3 rebounds. It's just his presence on the floor, folks. It's, that's all it is. It's not any of his really production. We know he can go for, you know, 20, 20 five plus points a night we know he's got that ability but it's just his presence on the floor a nice veteran leadership presence it matters all right Duncan Robinson had a great game and we don't say that too often 20 points four assists eight rebounds on six of 11 from three and I'm giving all the credit to Goran Dragic I don't care <laughs> Duncan Robinson is not consistent but Goran Dragic is and he makes other players better Alrighty, Bam out of bio, 16 points, 7 assists, 8 rebounds. Great night by him. I mean, we all know this man can play. Jimmy Butler, 18 points, 4 assists, 5 rebounds. And we still see Trevor Reza here at the 3, Jimmy Butler at the 4. Uh, Trevor Reza, not a great night. 2 points on 1 of 7 shooting and only 3 rebounds. And a uh, minus 1 on the floor in a win. So not truly great there. Um, Alrighty, but then off the bench, Tyler here goes for 17 points and 2 assists and 3 rebounds. Just enough to get the win over this Pacers team. Alrighty, let's talk about the Pacers now. Once again, losing <laughs> losing against a kind of above average average team here. Classic Pacers. Once again, folks, I don't think we've taken the Pacers to win a game ever this season. I don't think we've bet the Pacers at all this season. And I'm definitely glad we don't because, man, oh, man, this is not a solid, consistent team at all. All right, here we go. Malcolm Brogdon, 7 points, 7 rebounds on 16% shooting. Not great. Karis LeVert still struggling a little bit. 14 points, 6 assists. He had 4 steals. Absolutely fantastic. But uh, or for, oh, of 4 from 3, only 14 points. He's got to be, you know, kind of the second leading scorer on this team. We got to see Devontae Sabonis do his thing and Karis LeVert also do his thing. Um, so until we start seeing that, we can't take this Pacers team too seriously. Miles Turner, 15 points, 6 rebounds, 3 blocks. Great night by him. DePontis Sabonis, 9 points, 14 rebounds. He was a minus 11 on the floor. The, the biggest minus on the floor for his team. Not good at all. And Justin Holiday, 5 points, 2 steals, 2 assists on 18% shooting. So very, very poor shooting night here for this Pacers team. This is kind of why we don't like the Pacers. That's why we thought Karis LeVert would probably help the Pacers out because he's usually a decent scorer. But he hasn't really been doing anything consistently here for this Pacers team. And then just to finish off this Pacers team, off the bench, we get TJ McConnell, 11 points, 5 assists, 7 rebounds, and Doug McDermott, 14 points and 3 rebounds off the bench. Not bad. He shot 83% too, so get it done, Dougie. Um, alrighty, so Pacers, can't buy them. That is not changing. <laughs> Alrighty, moving on to Mavericks and the Celtics in another game in our moneymaker. Mavericks plus one. They went out right. We can't trust this Celtics team just quite yet, folks, still. Uh, so let's start with the Mavericks. We know that uh, Chris Porzingis and Luka Doncic were both in the starting lineup, but that's all we need to see for this Mavericks team. So Luka Doncic, 36 points on 73% shooting and 7-11 from three. I mean, absolutely magnificent. The only shots he missed were three-pointers. Three so yes, we'll get that. Absolutely efficient all day and got 36 points with five assists and eight rebounds. Fantastic night. Josh Richardson, eight points, four assists, six rebounds. Chris Porzingis, 19 points, two steals, two assists, eight rebounds on 40% shooting. Maxi Kleber, five points, two assists, three rebounds. And Dorian Finney-Smith, 11 points and nine rebounds. All righty, off the bench, Tim Hardaway Jr., a little bit of a lackluster game. Not that kind of six-man-of-the-year candidate game that we're expecting by this man. Seven points on uh, one of six from three, 30% overall. But Jalen Brunson off the bench, look at this man, get it done. 21 points on 80% shooting five rebounds three assists and able to get the win basically because of that great bench performance by that man so Luca gets it done Chris that Porzingis gets it done and they just needed that third and they got it with Jalen Brunson so good overall game here by the Mavericks now let's go to the Celtics all righty we got a change in the starting lineup folks Grant Williams um 
or Robert Williams did not play. Uh, so Moritz Wagner gets the starting center start here. We saw, you know, newly acquired here, Moritz Wagner. Evan Fournier still coming off the bench. So this is the lineup that the Celtics were rocking with this game. Kemba at the one, Marcus Smart at the two, Jalen Brown at the three, Jason Tatum at the four, Moritz Wagner at the five. All right, so here we go. Kemba Walker, 22 points, six assists, five rebounds on, once again, not great shooting. 36% from the field, two of nine from three. He took the second most threes in the game. I don't want that. I want Jalen Brown and Jason Tatum to take all the threes. I don't want anybody else shooting the three. Maybe Marcus Smart in the first quarter because besides the first quarter, the man cannot hit a three to save his life. Uh, basically, J.J. Reddick can't hit a three if he's not coming off of a, uh, an on-ball screen. It just doesn't work. Um, alrighty, so Kemba Walker, 22 points on, 2 of 9 from 3, not great. Uh, Marcus Smart, 17 points, 7 assists, 5 rebounds, 2 steals. He also shot 2 of 7 from 3, not the greatest. Uh, Moritz Wagner, not the greatest here. Only started 15 minutes, but 2 points, 4 rebounds. Jason Tatum, 25 points, 9 rebounds, 3 assists. He was a minus 19 on the floor, man, oh man. Um, not great there. And Jalen Brown, he was the worst uh, player in the plus minus by far, minus 19. The second to most was minus 8 with Jalen Brown. Uh, third most was minus 3, minus 4 actually. So uh, not great here by Jason Brown and Jason, Jalen, Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown, the JT, JBs. Um, Jalen Brown, 24 points, four steals. Holy moly. One assist, four rebounds. He shot four of 11 from three. Jason Tatum shot one of eight from three. Just not consistent here. All right. So that's the starters. Nothing. I mean, they did have three players in 20 plus point category, which is fantastic. That's what you want. So I guess we'll give it up for them. They just weren't efficient on their shooting as classified as that. All right. Off the bench now. Nothing great here. Off the bench. Classic. Man, oh man. The Celtics team got these like a little deeper, but the, the bench output is not rising at all. Uh, Evan Fournier still very lackluster here. In 30 minutes of playing, 6 points and 3 rebounds off the bench. He only took 6 shots, shot 50%, 0 of 2 from 3. Don't think he's hit a 3 as a Celtic here. Um, but he was a plus 5 on the, fo on the floor. So, I mean, got it done defensively, so we'll give him it. Um, and then Peyton Pritchard. Eight points, two rebounds off the bench as well. But uh, just nothing really great here off the bench. And the Celtics, if they don't get that bench worked out, if they don't start being a little bit more efficient here from the field, from the three, they won't get it done because we see them just shoot 11 and up 47, 23% from three, while the Mavericks shot 19 of 39, 48% from three. That will be the difference there, absolutely. So Mavericks get the win over the Celtics. Still cannot buy this Celtics team at all. Alrighty, then that brings us to the Rockets and the Nets. And man, oh man, we called this game 1 million percent correctly. The spread was 12. It was a 12-point spread. Nets minus 12, Rockets plus 12. Now, we said we kind of liked the Rockets plus 12, but we saw John Wall wasn't going to play. And what do we know about these two teams? The Rockets, ever since, you know, Christian Wood has came back to the starting lineup, ever since kind of John Wall is kind of bang, playing a little bit consistently, even though he didn't play last night. Um, ever since, you know, uh, we'll call it classified as a trade deadline. Because ever since they kind of lost Victor Oladipo, they've kind of been like, all right, we know what we are now. I think Victor Oladipo kind of held this bit, team back just a little bit. Um, but what do we know about this Rockets team ever since the All-Star break? They are good, except in the fourth quarter. They blow it in the fourth quarter. And what do we know about this Nets team? They're good. They'll build up leads, but they'll lose it in the fourth quarter. But then, you know, five, four, three minutes left in the fourth quarter, they'll close out the game. They got great closers, but they do kind of flounder in the fourth quarter a little bit. So, 12-point spread, both teams not really great in the fourth quarter, um, and that's exactly what happened in this game. Rockets were leading literally the entire game. They were getting it done. Then the fourth quarter, they blew the lead, and when did the Nets start? When did the Nets officially take over the lead? Four minutes and 40 seconds left in the fourth quarter. So, they finally got it done in the final four minutes of the game. Rockets blow it in the fourth quarter. Nets win by 12. The spread was 12. We told y'all to stay away from it because it was no great value. Would have been a push. Push, or if I think it closed at 12.5, 12 and a half points. So however you got it, maybe you won by half a point, but still no real great value there. Had to wait for that squeeze out there. So really no great value here. We cannot trust these teams in the fourth quarter. So we had to stay away from it. And it pans out exactly how we said it would. Um, so here we go. Nets win 120 to 108 over the Rockets. So let's start here with the Nets. 
James Harden unfortunately had to leave uh, late to third quarter, so he did not play in the fourth quarter, but they still get the win. So very well done for this team closing out without James Harden. Fantastic. Uh, James Harden, 17 points, 6 assists, 8 rebounds. Kyrie Irving, 31 points, 12 of 6, 6 rebounds, 3 of 8 from 3, 48% overall. Not terrible there, and he was able to kind of close out the game as well. So very well done to Kyrie Irving. DeAndre Jordan, 2 points, 1 rebound. He only played 11 minutes. Joe Harris, yeah. Folks, 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 folks. I'm about to get a Joe Harris tattoo. I don't care anymore because I was about to scream right now, but I got uh, Joe Harris is so freaking consistent, folks. He's what Danny Green wants to be. I'm telling you. Got to give it up for Joe Harris. If there, Like we said, if there was a fifth man of the year, I'm giving it to Joe Harris, baby. The most consistent player on the star-studded team. Still able to find a way to be efficient and put up a ton of points. 28 points, 6 rebounds, 7 of 12 from 3. Fantastic! Magnifico, folks! Joe Harris. Love that man. Yes, sir. He's going to be the reason why this Nets team wins the championship. It's not going to be KD. It's not going to be Irving. It's going to be a little bit Harden. But it's going to be mostly the consistency, the clutch ability, the consistency again because it's so consistent. It's so consistent. You got to say it twice because it's so consistent. It's consistently consistent, folks. Do y'all not know this man, Joe Harris? Fifth man of the year. Give it to him. A new award here given out by takes by fans. It's the fifth man of the year, and it's Joe Harris. Alrighty, then Bruce Brown, 10 points, 6 rebounds on 33% shooting. So the starters all do pretty dang good here. And then the bench, folks, we know they're deep. Blake Griffin's getting into it. I mean, he was hitting some clutch threes in the fourth quarter. I mean, he couldn't, you know, be efficient from the three with Detroit, but I guess it was all a ploy. He played the long game, so I got to respect Blake Griffin for, for pulling the long con there. 11 points by Blake Griffin off the bench. Two Steals, one block, four assists, six rebounds on 80% shooting, two of three from three. Magnificent, man. Uh, uh, he was a plus 23 on the floor as well, so huge, great defense by that man as well. Man, oh, man, Blake Griffin, he fooled everybody. He fooled everybody to get out of Detroit. I respect it. I respect it. Go get that ring, my man. All righty, and then also Nicholas Claxton. Love to see that man stepping up as well. Love seeing that his minutes aren't dwindling now that Blake Griffin's here uh, off the bench. But Nicholas Claxton, 12 points, 8 rebounds, shot 85%. Yes, sir, he played tw 20 minutes. Nicholas, Nicholas Claxton is getting into this freaking uh, – he's getting into the rotation, folks. He's going to be good. He's a great bench player already. We'll see if he can kind of elevate his game. Like we said, is he only uh, a year in? Yeah, only one year experience. Man, oh man, get it done, young fella. Alrighty, so the Nets get it done. Everybody gets it done. Everybody freaking gets it done. Too good out here. <laughs> Steam is too freaking good. Uh, too deep. Alrighty, and then the Rockets now. Alrighty, so we know that um, no John Wall for this game. So this was their starting lineup. Kevin Porter Jr., Sterling Brown. Love seeing Sterling Brown in the starting lineup. Uh, Christian Wood, Deshaun Tate, and Daniel House Jr. So here we go. Kevin Porter Jr. did pretty well out here. 20 points, 6 assists, shot 2 of 3 from 3, and 56% overall. Sterling Brown, only a little bit of a lackluster night by him. 11 points, 1 rebound, uh, 3 of 7 from 3. Christian Wood, 14 points, 2 steals, 3 assists, 8 rebounds. Pretty decent night by him. And uh, Deshaun Tate, 8 points, 3 assists. Daniel House Jr., 18 points, 5 rebounds. Uh, so uh, decent there in the starting lineup. Off the bench, they got decent production as well. Kelly Olenek, 14 points, 4 assists, 3 rebounds. He was a minus 20 on the floor in 24 minutes. Not the greatest. And DJ Augustine, 11 points, 4 assists, and 5 rebounds. But it's tough to kind of judge this performance because they were going against the Nets. They just unfortunately blew it in the fourth quarter. And I don't know, I don't know what it is. Why, are the, why is this Rockets team blowing games in the fourth quarter? I think we're going to have to start looking at the coach a little bit. Uh, maybe also their lack of kind of star power, their kind of lack of leadership on the floor with John Wall not playing so uh, a little unfortunate here but this Rockets team I want to say they're pretty decent this is a decent team it's a decent team uh, after the all-star break but they need John Wall to start playing consistently need that kind of um, great leadership that nice leadership veteran presence that he can kind of bring to this team um, so um, water roof for the Rockets they make it tough though Alrighty, <laughs> moving on to the Jazz and the Grizzlies in a closer game, close game here. Uh, Jazz get the win, 111-107. We know no Donovan Mitchell for this, so that's why we stayed away from it. 
and classic Grizzlies right at 500 entering this game and we know once they get to 500 they have to they have to lose <laughs> this team does not like to be above 500 the most they've ever been above 500 this season I think is like two games and I think they got it kind of got lucky at that time because it's usually one game and then they're back to 500 then they're back to below 500 so classic Grizzlies doing classic Grizzly Grizzlies things out here all right, so let's start here with the Jazz. Mike Connolly fills in absolutely magnificent for Donovan Mitchell. 26 points, 4 steals, 7 assists, 4 rebounds on 61% shooting. Magnificent. Joe Ingles uh, steps up in the starting spot a little bit here. 10 points, 5 rebounds, 2 assists. He shot 2 of 6 from 3. All right. Uh, Rudy Gobert, 8 points, but the 12 rebounds classic. Rudy Gobert game. Classic, man. That man is so classic and consistent there. Uh, Royce O'Neal, 9 points, 6 rebounds. Bojan Bogdanovic, 23 points, 5 of 12 from 3. Not terrible. Uh, also, 5 rebounds, 3 assists, and 2 steals to go along with that. So, Mike Connolly, love to see that man stepping it up when his number is called. He usually always gets it done, but man, oh man, has to step it up as kind of the main point guard here, and he gets it done, so love it. Alrighty, Jordan Clarkson off the bench. Yes, sir, does what he does. 24 points, 7 rebounds, and he was, uh, was he efficient here? 36% from the field. The man took 22 shots. This man off the bench took the most shots in the entire, with the, for the entire team. I mean, uh, classic Jordan Clarkson here. 4 of 15 from 3. I can't call that good, unfortunately. 26% from 3. He was chucking it up. Luckily, some of them were falling. Uh, but Jordan Clarkson, man, 24 points. Yes, sir, getting it done off the bench. Jeez. All right, so the Jazz gets it done. Now we go to the Grizzlies. Couldn't quite get the win here. This team can't quite beat kind of, you know, the top three teams in the East and the West. They can kind of beat everybody else, but kind of those top echelon teams, they can't get it done. So not great. Uh, John Morant here, 36 points, three steals, seven assists, two rebounds. He shot 61% from the field. Also got to the line 15 times, knocked down 12 of them. So classic John Morant game, John Morant game a little bit here. Desmond Bain here in the starting lineup at the two. Uh, seven points on 30% shooting. Five assists, five rebounds. I'll give him those, but the shooting not great. Uh, Jonas Valanciunas, 16 points, 14 rebounds. Held his own a little bit against Rudy Gobert, so I'll give it to him. Kyle Anderson, 18 points, 11 rebounds. And Dylan Brooks, 17 points, three steals, one assist, one rebound. So... Overall, kind of a classic game here by this Grizzlies team. Just unfortunately, they they have no real great bench. They don't have anybody that they can kind of really turn to. They don't have that Jordan Clarkson off the bench. They do not have that. I mean, we got DeAnthony Melton, five points on 33% shooting off the bench. Xavier Tillman, two points on 33% shooting off the bench. Tyus Jones, two points on 25% shooting off the bench. And uh, Killen Tile, four points on 50% shooting off the bench. So they got really no great scoring output off the bench and that's what we know about the Grizzlies they need to get it all done with the starters but they can't <laughs> they just can't so uh truly unfortunate that they didn't make a big old trade at the trade deadline because I think it's going to be kind of like last season yeah you might get the eighth seed in the bubble but mm, you're going to be first round exit so nothing truly great here by this Grizzlies team Alrighty, moving on to the Knicks and the Timberwolves. And man, oh man, the one, the the night that we finally believe in the Knicks, they lose against the Timberwolves. Man, oh man, this was uh, one of the moneymaker picks that we did not hit. Knicks minus three and a half. They lose the game by one. What is that? Come on, Knicks. Why did they lose? Let's start here with the Knicks. We got to find out why they lost this game. Uh, well, we kind of know. Um, Malik Beasley for the Timberwolves hit an absolute clutch three-pointer with 37 seconds left in the game to go up one. And then R.J. Barrett for the Knicks to kind of win the game. Mid-range jumper as time expires does not drop. So, little unfortunate there. No clutch gene on this Knicks team, unfortunately. But here we go. Let's start here with the Knicks. Julius Randle, 26 points, 6 assists, and 12 rebounds. Not bad from him. Shot 55% in 2 of 5 from 3. Alfred Payton, 17 points, 2 steals, 3 assists, 5 rebounds. R.J. Barrett, 23 points, 2 assists, 3 rebounds. Uh, Nerlens Noel is really not the greatest out here. Doesn't really do anything for the scoring output, but he's got decent defense, I guess. But definitely need a little bit of a scoring center out here for the Knicks, and they don't have that. So Nerlens Noel, 2 points, 3 rebounds. He was a plus 1 in 23 minutes, so I'll give him that. But we need some scoring production because he was the only one that was really lackluster here for the starters. 
Uh, Reggie Bullock put up 10 points and 4 rebounds and 3 assists and 2 steals to round out the starters. So the starters kind of all got it done. So that means it's probably the bench here. So like we say, the Knicks need the starters and the bench all having collective great games or they won't win. And we just saw right here. But off the bench, only person that stepped up was Alec Burks. 13 points and 3 rebounds. Taj Gibson had seven points. He also had eight rebounds, so shout out to Taj Gibson. Um, but then Emmanuel quickly, zero points. Obi Toppin, only three points. And we see Derek Jones or Derek Rose did not play this game. So no real great production here off the bench or no real great deep production, I guess we should say. So uh, a little unfortunate here by the Knicks, man. We cannot trust this team. They've got a nice storyline. They've got a nice story, but um, they're not gonna. They'll they'll be first round exits. I'm ready to call it. I think we've seen enough by this Knicks team. We bought the hype for about a week, and we and rightfully so. We were winning on our bets on the Knicks. We were uh, looking at the Knicks. We were breaking down the Knicks uh, for that kind of weak stretch that they were good. But mm, I'm ready to call them bad again. <laughs> I'm ready to call them bad. Um, all right, the Timberwolves here. I mean, uh, this was a close game, so I guess I'm banging on the Knicks a little bit too hard here. But, man, you can't lose to the Timberwolves. You just can't. You can't. They're the worst team in the league. Um, all right, here we go. Carl Anthony Towns, 18 points, 17 rebounds, 6 assists. Fantastic. Anthony Edwards had another good game here. 24 points, 3 steals, 3 blocks, 3 assists, 2 rebounds. So he was getting it done literally in every facet of the game. And it shows here in the plus minus, a plus 14, the best plus on his team. I think the only plus, the, only, the best plus in the entire game. So great work by Anthony Edwards on the defensive end on the floor. Uh, what else do we get here? Malik Beasley, 20 points. Like we said, he hit the big old 3 for them. Um, Rudy, Ricky Rubio, 9.7 assists and, uh, Jaden McDaniels, 18 points, five rebounds, three assists. So the starters all had some nice nights here. They didn't get any real great production from the bench, kind of like the Knicks. So just unfortunate here. The Timberwolves were a little bit more clutch than the Knicks. Truly unfortunate. Um, so Knicks lose. Not good. Not good. Alrighty, we'll go to another team that's losing, not goodly here. The Raptors lose against the Thunder. No, no Shea Gillis Alexander, and the uh, the Raptors still can't beat them with get you know Fred Van Vliet and Siakam and OG Ananobi. So not great. Kyle Lowry didn't play, which is you know decent reason why they lost. But uh, still really should be no reason to lose to a Shea Gillis Alexander list Thunder. But let's shout out this team because they all got it done. So here we go. Theo Melendon, 11 points, 6 assists, 7 rebounds. Kind of a great night. He didn't shoot well 18%, but everything else was pretty dang good. Uh, Savi. My, my, we're just calling him Savi Mick, man. I know. It's my apologies for not pronouncing that last name. But, um, yeah, that's a tough one. Uh, but here we go. 22 points, 9 rebounds for Savi. Absolutely magnificent. Moses Brown, 20 points, 12 rebounds. Isaiah Roby, 17 points, 10 rebounds. Kenich Williams, 10 points, 8 rebounds. They were getting it done on the glass. Holy cow. Raptors, man, get it done on the rebounding category. What are we doing? The, the Raptors had 35 rebounds. The Thunder had 64. Oh, my gosh. Man. 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 Holy cow. All right. So the Thunder team, I mean, definitely, well, everybody stepped up here. So I'm absolutely about it. No Dort, no, um, no Shea Gales Alexander. And they all step up here. Everybody in 10 points plus, and literally everybody in five plus, seven, six, seven plus rebounds here in the starting lineup. This is absolutely magnificent here by the Thunder. Man, oh man, do they have a secretly good squad? Man. They step it up. I got to give it to them. Very, very, uh, we're about to. Uh, what? Where are they in the record? They got a chance to make the playoffs. Cause I think I'm about to get on this Thunder train, folks. Damn. Currently 13 in the West. Uh, they're only two games out from that uh, 10th seed to get into the playing tournament. Two, three games back. So let's see what they can do. But if Shea Gillis Alexander can kind of, you know, be a little bit healthy, a little bit more consistent here. Um, I think this is a solid team. People are stepping up. Love it. They also get people stepping up off this bench here. Justin Jackson, 12 points, three assists, four rebounds off the bench. Darius Miller, 11 points and two rebounds off the bench. So man, oh man, the starters all got it done. Solid contribution here off the bench. Absolutely killed it on the glass and the Thunder get the win. So Raptors, man, He's Pascal Siakam, Aaron Baines, OG Ananubi, and you still can't out-rebound this Thunder team? Mm, 
ma not good. The Magic, I'm ready to call it. The Magic has officially run out for this Raptors team. The Cinderella story over the last three seasons with Nick Nurse and all these role players. Uh, the clock has stricken midnight, unfortunately. Man, all right. So the Raptors now, Fred Van Vliet, 18 points, 5 steals, holy moly, he had 4, oh my god, 18 points, 4 blocks, 5 steals, 7 assists, 4 rebounds, he didn't shoot well, 29% and 3 of 10 from 3, but everything else was fantastic. All right, Gary Trent Jr., man, oh, man. He's like, I'm sick of y'all being trash and losing. So I'm about to take 22 shots. He scored 31 points. Absolutely fantastic. Decently efficiently as well. 54% and 6 of 11 from 3. So I'll get up for Gary Trent Jr. Finally having a good game here. And we see that he's at the 2. So Fred Van Vliet at the 1. Gary Trent Jr. at the 2 here. Aaron Baines back in the starting rotation here. 0 points, 2 rebounds. Pascal Siakam, 14 points, 7 rebounds, 4 assists. Did not shoot well either, 22%. And OG Ananubi, 20 points, 11 rebounds on 38% shooting. Once again, not great there. So some decent scoring production here. Not efficiently, though. Couldn't get any rebounds either. And then their bench wasn't as good as this Thunder bench either. The only good bench player here was uh, Chris Boucher, who we can usually kind of count on here off the bench. He's usually decently consistent. Uh, 10 points, 4 rebounds, 3 assists. Also, let's shout out Stanley Johnson because he had 8 points, 5 rebounds off the bench in 18 minutes. So not terrible there. But uh, man, oh man, the Thunder, they went by 10. Give it up for the Thunder, man. Alrighty, let's uh, keep moving on here. Last couple of games here. Kings and the Spurs. Spurs win 120-106. We chose to stay away from this game just because this was in a second in the back-to-back. -back and we know it's a little wonky. It never goes kind of the same way that game number one went. So we always stay kind of away from those. Uh, so let's go over this very quickly. The scoring output was not as much as it was in that first meeting where the Kings put up 135 points. Only held to 106 here. Uh, but here we go. The uh, the Kings. De'Aaron Fox, 20 points, 4 assists. Tyrese Halliburton, 18 points, 2 assists. Raquan Holmes, 14 points, 15 rebounds. He's been really kind of stepping it up here a little bit. Love seeing that. Harrison Barnes, 6 points, 5 assists, 14 rebounds. Didn't shoot great, 25%. And Buddy Heald didn't shoot great either. But 14 points, 1 block, 1 steal, 1 assist, 1 rebound. But only on 27% shooting. So not the greatest here. Um, all the starters doing decent, decent. The bench, though, D'Lon Wright, 16 points, 2 steals, 3 assists, 3 rebounds. He shot 50%, but then nothing else really great off that bench. So, little, uh, little lackluster scoring night by the Kings, a little bit. Now, let's go to the Spurs now, finally getting it back. I mean, they were on a, uh... Uh, what were this next... This Spurs team was on a big old losing streak, I think, as well. What do they got uh, going on? Uh, they are 5-5 five and five in their last 10, just finally getting a win streak here with this win over the Kings. But uh, they finally get back on track here. DeMar DeRozan, 26 points, 7 assists, 5 rebounds, shot 60%. Fantastic. Keldon Johnson, 11 points, 5 rebounds. Jacob Podol, 12 points, 14 rebounds, 5 of those offensive. Fantastic. Derek White, 18 points, 3 assists, 6 rebounds. And DeJounte Murray, 12 points, 3 steals, 6 assists, 6 rebounds. So, usual starters getting it done. And then uh, Rudy Gay off the bench, 16 points, 8 rebounds, able to get it done as well. And let's shout out to uh, Drew Eubanks, 8 points, 5 rebounds in only 12 minutes. So, not bad here by the Spurs. Scoring was on point, and they're able to get the win over the Kings. Alrighty, our last game in our moneymaker, Bucks and the Lakers. Well, we decided to trust the Lakers here with Andre Drummond. Unfortunately, could not close out the game very well. We had the Lakers plus nine. They lose by 15, unfortunate. So uh, two for two on our moneymaker officially. Uh, took some risks on the Knicks and Lakers that did not pay off, unfortunately. Uh, but let's start here with the Bucks. Able to get the win, so very well done. Giannis, 25 points, 4 assists, 10 rebounds, shot 61%, 1 of 1 from 3, and 8 of 10 from the free throw line. Yes, sir, Giannis, this is what you do when you're efficient, folks. You get the win. Giannis, take notes on this game. Uh, Chris Middleton, 17 points, 8 assists, 6 rebounds. He shot 1 of 3 from 3. Not terrible overall. Uh, Brooke Lopez, 4 points. Three assists, five rebounds, just getting it done on the defensive end. Classic Brook Lopez. Dante DiVincenzo had a pretty solid game as well. 13 points, three steals, two assists, five rebounds, three of six from three. Just being efficient. That's what the Bucs were this game. They were just efficient, and that's why they won this game. So take Bucks. Truly take notes because you're not out of the clear being like a good team or a bad team yet. Uh, you're the third best team in the East, which isn't really that great because you're behind the 76ers and the Nets, who are, I think are clearly better and more consistent than this Bucks team. But this is what being efficient gets you folks a nice clean win here where nobody has to do a little bit too much 
Uh, but Dante or Drew Holiday had a fantastic game, probably his best game of the season here. Twenty eight points, one block. Four steals, six assists, eight rebounds on 68% shooting and three of five from three. So efficiency makes everybody play better. Take notes, Bucks. And they didn't even really need anybody off their bench. I do want to point out that Thaddeus Antetokounmpo is getting a lot more minutes here, and I'm all about it. 12 here. I would like to see him. He could probably play 15 to 20 minutes. So I would like to see him get more minutes here. But it's starting to get here slowly but surely. Ever since, you know, everybody was off on this kind of, all the starters were off on the Bucks like two or three games ago, and Thanis, Thanis had that great game. They're starting to play him a little bit more, so I do truly like that. Eight points by that man, two steals, one rebound, and only 12 minutes off the bench, and he was efficient. One of one from three, and 50% overall from the field, so let's get uh, Thanis a little bit more incorporated into kind of this bench rotation. He's doing better than Pat Conifton. I mean, Pat Conifton had five points, five rebounds in 27 minutes on 40% shooting. Come on, get Thanis up in there. Um, and then Brian Forbes is probably their best, best bench performer here. Maybe nine points, two steals, one rebound, 20 minutes. But uh, Thaddeus, he's efficient out there, so get him out there a little bit more. Uh, but very well done for the Bucks for getting a nice win here over a LeBron James and Anthony davis list Lakers team. <laughs> Uh, but here we go. Andre Drummond starting lineup. Mantras. Harold still playing 25 minutes off the bench. Yes, sir. Marcus saw barely playing. That's what we're talking about. That's what we want to see. Uh, so here we go. This new Lakers lineup without AD and LeBron James. Here it is. Dennis Schroeder at the 1, KCP at the 2, Kyle Kuzma at the 3, Markeith Morris at the 4, and Andre Drummond at the 5. All righty, so here we go. Dennis Schroeder, 17 points, 1 block, 1, is, one steal, 8 assists, and 3 rebounds. He shot 42% and 3 of 7 from 3, so or 3 of 8 from 3, 33% overall. So not a terrible game by Dennis Schroeder. KCP, atrocious game. 2 points, 1 assist, 3 rebounds, 0 of 4 from the field. Didn't even hit anything. Um, only get, was able to score because he got to the line. <laughs> All right, uh, Andre Drummond, he only played 14 minutes in his debut, unfortunately. We should have taken that into greater consideration that he wasn't going to be playing 25, 30 minutes. Uh, so 14 minutes out here, four points, two assists, and one rebound. Markeith Morris, 15 points, six rebounds on 62% shooting. Kyle Kuzma, man, oh, man, could you be efficient, please, from the three? 16 points, seven rebounds, three assists. All that's good, and 41% from the field is good. But, man, one of nine from three? Come on. Damn. Damn. Ugh, unfortunate. So Kyle Kuzma, not efficient and uh, decent overall. Uh, but then we get coming down to the bench. Montrez Harrell was the leading scorer of the game. Not the bench, the game. 19 points leading scorer, Montrez Harrell. Get this, man. Sixth man of the year. I'm over it. I'm ready to lock it in. Montrez Harrell, man. 19 points, five rebounds on 54% shooting. 25 minutes off the bench, leading scorer for the squad. Good, good. Montrose Harold is the third best Laker here. Maybe fourth best, not Andre Drummond's here, but right now I'm calling Montrose Harold. He's the best Laker on the floor. He's the best available Laker to play. I'm, I'm going to call it like that. So uh, Montrose Harold gets it done. Love it. Love it. All righty, and then the last game of the night, the Bulls and the Suns. And, man, oh, man, the Vucevic. Maybe Vucevic is a curse, man. Maybe he's a curse because Magic haven't been able to kind of win solid with him and Aaron Gordon on the floor. And now that he's with Zach Levine, it's not getting it done either. And, man, oh, man, I mean, Vucevic, I mean, we knew you can't win with just a big. It does not work. That does not work. It didn't work with Anthony Davis, so it's really not going to work with anybody else. And it didn't work with Vucevic. What more proof do we need that centers by themselves cannot get it done? He couldn't get it done with Aaron Gordon either. That just didn't work out. And now he's here with, um, uh, what's his face? Um, Zach Levine, and that still doesn't work. All righty. So let's start here with the Bulls. Zach Levine didn't even play this game, so a little unfortunate there. Once again, I mean, now that Vucevic is here, Zach Levine's taking time off. That gives me kind of flashbacks to when he was with the Magic of Aaron Gordon not playing with him in the lineup. So... I don't know, man. Vucevic may be a little bit of a, a little bit of a curse. He's good. He's great. Don't get us wrong, but him winning with other players, it does not work. Him on the floor does not contribute to, to solid wins. So that's a little bit of a red flag. Bulls are now 0-3 with Vucevic on the floor. All right, so let's start here with the Suns since they won. 
Um, Chris Paul, 19 points, 14 assists. Yes, sir. It gets it done. Uh, Devin Booker, 45 big all points efficiently. 70% shooting, 2 of 5 from 3. Uh, fantastic night by Devin Booker. DeAndre Ian still gets it done. 10 points, 4 rebounds. Jay Crowder, 10 points, 3 rebounds. McCall Bridges, 6 points, 2 rebounds. So everybody else was still able to score in the starting rotation. And look at this bench, man. Yes, sir. Cameron Payne, 9 points, 4 assists, 4 rebounds. Cameron Johnson, 2 points, 2 assists, 2 rebounds. And Dario Sarek, 16 points, 5 rebounds. So, yes, sir. All the bench, good pieces. Kind of got it done here. Tory Craig played 15 minutes, didn't get a point. Uh, but, hey, all the others, all the other bench performers got it done. So, we'll uh, give that man a little bit of a pass there. All righty, now let's go to the Bulls now. All righty, as we said, no Zach Levine. So, now the starting lineup is Thomas Satornsky at the 1, Patrick Williams at the 2, Thaddeus Young back in the starting lineup at the 3, Laurie Markkanen at the 4, and Vucevic at the 5. So, it didn't do too bad either. I mean, look at this. Thaddeus Young at the 3, 19 points, 10 rebounds on 50% shooting. Laurie Markkanen, uh, 16 points, 10 rebounds on 38% shooting, 2 of 8 from 3, not the greatest. Vucevic, 24 points, 10 rebounds on 44% shooting. Patrick Williams, 16 points, one assist, one steal, three rebounds. Thomas Sertornski, nine points, seven assists, three rebounds. So the, the starters all had a pretty decent night there. Uh, definitely missing Zach Levine a little bit. We see Daniel Tice playing some hefty minutes off the bench. Six points, five rebounds in 19 minutes. Not terrible. Um, and then Denzel Valentine off the bench. Great night by him. 19 points, four assists, five rebounds, three of nine from three, 44% overall. Just unfortunately... Suns were a little bit clutch down the stretch. Devin Booker's hitting some nice clutch shots when the Bulls were trying to yo-yo between like a two and three point game, three uh, possession game, and uh, the nice clutchness by uh, Devin Booker was helping him out a little bit there. So just unfortunate here by the Bulls running into a nice star-studded great Phoenix team, but uh, man, oh man, they gotta start getting their first win without with Vucevic because they're um, they're kind of they're still ninth in the East, I guess. Still got time to get it all to work, but they need to make it to work because I want to see this Bulls team in the playing tournament. I kind of want to see them in the playoffs and see what they can do, but uh, got to get there first. Alrighty, uh, those are all the games from last night. Now let's um, do our moneymaker for today's action. Let's see if we're getting any great value anywhere. But first, let's see what's on tap tonight. Any uh, nationally televised games? Yes, sir. All right, here we go. Wizards, Pistons, probably definitely stay away from that game in our moneymaker. 76ers, Cavs, I think we're swallowing a lot of points with the 76ers. Uh, Hornets, Nets on TNT, 730. That should be interesting. If we're getting eight points with the Hornets, we may take that. We may, we may. We'll see what we get. Um, Warriors, Heat, Magic, Pelicans, Hawks, Spurs, and oh, the late game. 10 o'clock on TNT, Nuggets, Clippers. Ooh, gonna be a good one. Woohoo! I think I'm ready to take the Nuggets. I'm loving Aaron Gordon on this Nuggets team, folks. They are getting it done. This is a true great team, so we might be taking that. But uh, let's refresh our lines here. Let's get up-to-date lines. See what we got going on. Where is the value? We're ready to sniff it out. We got the Heat and the Mavericks. Those were our two solid picks. And then we just kind of took leaps of faith with the Lakers and the Knicks a little bit. But let's get uh, let's get on track here. Let's hit a nice little, maybe even five-teamer. Let's see what we get here. All righty. Here we go. Uh, Cavs 76ers. 76ers minus 9.5. Cavs plus 9.5. So uh, let's see if Joel Embiid is back. He is still out. Darn it. Joel Embiid, man. He can't be MVP anymore. I think he's missed him too many games. And it's truly unfortunate because the man was having a great season. So I think um, Damian Lillard and um, uh, James Harden having uh, kind of better cases than Joel Embiid now since he's missed so many games. Truly unfortunate. For the Cavs, Kevin Love, game time decision. Matthew Della Vadova, game time decision. De decision. Larry Nance Jr. is out, and Jarrett Allen is also out. So, yes, we are going to take the minus 9.5 here for the 76ers. We like the 76ers against bad teams. Against good teams, we're not going to trust it without Joel Embiid. But Jarrett Allen being out, um, it's all going to come down to Darius Garland and Colin Sexton. Those, that's the only offense that the Cavs have. So, we'll take the 76ers here. We'll swallow the 9.5. That should have no problem covering. Um I mean, this Cavs team is really, really not great offensively, man. Truly not great. So we'll uh, we'll swallow the nine and a half here for the 76ers. 
Alrighty, next game up, Wizards, Pistons. Wizards minus three, Pistons plus three. Definitely going to stay away from it. I mean, this Pistons team, um, they've been keeping it decently close. I mean, they just got blown out by the 70s, uh, by the Blazers last night. But, I mean, nobody stepped it up there for the Pistons. But uh, usually they've been kind of decent since the, uh, since the trade deadline of keeping it close, keeping it competitive. Uh, Wizards, Ish Smith is still out. Davis Burton is still out. Damn it, Davis. Uh, Bradley Beal, game time decision. Interesting. Uh, Raul Neto, game time decision as well. And for the Pistons, Wayne Ellington, game time decision. Rodney Magruder, game time decision. Jaleel Okafor, game time decision. Can we see Jaleel Okafor back? I'd like to see what that man can do. Um, and that's really it. So we're going to stay away from this one. Can't trust the Wizards. Definitely can't trust this Pistons. But uh, I'm a, I'm. Uh, I'm I'm bow Jalil Oak for being a game time decision. Now you know he's not definite out yet, so uh, we'll see what the Pistons do tonight. <clears throat> but we'll stay away from it. Ah, uh, I thought we could get some good value here, but it's not. But I think it's good the other way. So uh, let's talk about it. Here we go. Hornets plus two and a half. Nets minus two and a half. If everybody's gonna go for this Nets team, we're taking. The, we'll swallow the two and a half. I like this Hornets team. Don't get us wrong, but this Nets team, they they win. They win the games. And if we only have to swallow two and a half here, that's magnifico value. We'll take it. Uh, but everybody's got to be good to go. So here we go. Malik Monk is a game time decision for the Hornets. For the Nets, Blake Griffin's out. Damn, resting, Blake. Come on. Rest. Rest. You played like four games. You need more rest. Man, Duncan really takes too much out of Blake Griffin. Kevin Durant is out. Oh, this is a big one. We can't take it. James Harden is out. So it's only going to be Kyrie. I think he may get it done, but I'm not going to bet on just Kyrie. So we'll stay away from this one. If it was just James Harden, I'd take the minus two and a half. It's just Kyrie, though. So we'll, I'll stay away from it. All righty. Continuing on, Warriors in the Heat. Warriors plus three, Heat minus three. I like the Heat minus three, I think. I like the Heat minus three. Let's see if everybody's going to go. Everybody's going to go for the Warriors. Now for the Heat, um, Kendrick Nunn is a game time decision. So Victor Oladipo is playing. Goran Dragic is playing. Jimmy Butler is playing. Come on. What more do we need to see? Heat minus three. Yes, they're in a back-to-back, -back, but I don't care about that. I don't care. We just won with the Heat minus two and a half last night. We're going to win again with the Heat at home minus three. Everybody playing? Come on. That's a no-brainer. That's fantastic value. That's the game to bet, folks. There it is. That's the one great game of the night. Alrighty, keep on going here. Magic and the Pelicans. Magic plus nine, Pelicans minus nine. And we got to give it up for this Magic team. I mean, they've been doing pretty good. They just beat the Clippers. Everybody's really been stepping it up on that team ever since they sold house. So I got to give it up for them. But uh, here we go. For the Magic, Gary Harris is out. Jonathan Isaac is still out. Mark Foles is out for the entire season. So basically, the usual suspects are still out for the Magic. And for the Pelicans, Lonzo Ball, game time decision. Zion Williamson, a game time decision. All righty. If Lon, y'all know how I feel about Lonzo Ball, I mean, let's go to our, um, Let's go to our favorite Twitter account here, NBA Fantasy Labs. Let's see if they have any information on uh, Lonzo or Zion. Uh, Lonzo's missed uh, four of the last five, or five games, and they won four of the last five. So, I mean, I'm not a big fan of Lonzo Ball. I don't really think he helps the team at all. I don't think he really hurts the team at all. He's got good defense and nice passing skills, but doesn't translate to wins. So what are we doing out here? Um, alrighty. Um, doesn't look like we're having any information here. They haven't really updated this in a while. No real big uh, information here. Hmm. Alrighty. Oh, Joel Embiid is coming back though. Not today, but Saturday. Out Thursday. Expected to play Saturday. Thank goodness. Got to get him back. All right. So. This is a little interesting. Going to stay away from it. Not going to swallow the nine here. The plus nine for the Magic would have seemed a little appetizing. Um. If Zion Williamson is definitely not going to play, that's going to be interesting, and I would take the uh, the Magic plus nine, but we'll stay away from it. A little too many question marks there. Alrighty, last two games up here: Hawks, Spurs. Hawks minus one, Spurs plus one. Is Lou Williams? If Lou Williams is making his debut, we'll swallow the one here. We'll live on the edge. Let's see what we get. Lou Williams, game time decision. Okay, I think we've been seeing outs for him. So hopefully he's good to go. Chris Dunn, John Collins, and Cam Reddish all still out. Um, so, okay. All right, for the Spurs here. Lonnie Walker, game time decision. Trey Lyles, game time decision. Keita Bates, Diop, game time decision. And Georgie Deang, game time decision. So basically everybody's go good to go for the Spurs. But if Lou Williams is playing, man, and I think the spread reflects it a little bit, honestly. Huh... Damn, I really wish we had solid information on Lou Williams right now. 
Let's go with it. I'm ready to take the Hawks. I think Lou Williams is going to play. We'll bet on it. Hawks minus one. Lou Williams. That's why we're choosing it. All right. And then the last game of the night. The nut. Oh, I already. Oh, yes, yes. This could be the best value of the night. Forget the heat minus three. I think this could be the better value here. Nuggets, Clippers, Nuggets minus two. Are you nuts? Yes, we'll take that. I don't even need to see who's in and out. Hopefully, everybody's going to go for the Nuggets before we officially lock it in. So, let's see who's going to go. Oh, every, everybody's going to go. Yes, the Nuggets. Everybody's good to go. Fantastic. And then for the Clippers, Rondo still out. Patrick Beverly is out. Sergi Baca is out. Paul George is still What? What? Minus two. Oh, my goodness. Hammer this. Hammer it. Nail it. Hammer it some more. Bet your house on it. Yes. We only have to swallow two points. What are you, nuts? Yes. I'll, I'd swallow nine. I would swallow nine points here. Nuggets get the win. No problem. Um, Aaron Gordon is filling in great here, and everybody else is still getting great production. Michael Porter Jr. has not taken a step back, though I thought he would with Aaron Gordon in the lineup. Um, Jamal Murray is still getting it done. Joe Kick is still having success. Literally, Aaron Gordon is not disrupting this offense at all. He's just he's just making it better. He's literally the only trade at the trade deadline that has kind of fledged out 100% so far. So, yes, sir. Nuggets minus two. Best bet of the night. Best bet of the night. There it is. All righty. Yes, sir. Feeling great about this moneymaker here. 76ers minus nine and a half. Heat minus three. Hawks minus one. Nuggets, the best bet of the freaking night. Probably of the week so far. Nuggets minus two. Love that all day. Damn. Love that. Oof. All righty. All righty. That's our moneymaker for today. All righty. Let's go to Michael Carter. All right. Here we go. Our draft prospect of the day. We are on our 48. We're on our 73 day countdown. We are on day 48 of that NFL draft countdown, looking at a NFL draft prospect every single day, getting us ready for that NFL draft. Who should our teams be taking? Who should our teams be staying away from? Who should we maybe be betting on? Who should we maybe kind of overreach and extend to get just so we can secure him on our team? Um, so here we go. We're looking at Michael Carter running back from North Carolina today. We'll look at the stats. We'll look at some film and see how this man's looking to decide if he should be a, a part of our organization. Should he, should we, should we be buying his man, this man's Jersey? Should it be, should we? Let's see. <laughs> All right. So here we go. Uh, four seasons at North Carolina. Once again, college educated. Yes, sir. All righty, freshman year, 2017, he only had uh, 97 attempts for 559 yards, eight touchdowns. All righty, got into the uh, receiving game a little bit as well, 11 catches for 100 yards and a touchdown. Okay, then in 2018, his sophomore season, um, played a little less games there, um, only played nine games compared to 11 his first season, had 84 rushes for 597 yards, two touchdowns, had 25 receptions for 135 yards, so the production the efficiency came down a little bit, but he played less games. But uh, let's see if he kind of broke it out here in 2019 and 2020 where he was getting a lot of these touches. So here we go. Uh, junior season, 177 cat touches for 1,000 yards. three Only three touchdowns? Okay. Um, and then he also caught 21 balls for 154 yards and two touchdowns. And then in 2020, his senior season, 156 rushes for 1,245 yards. Fantastic. Nine touchdowns, 267 receiving yards, and two receiving touchdowns to go along with that. Now, he does have another running back kind of rivaling him in USC, who I think we are going to take a look at. Um, so he is kind of splitting carries, but uh, he did kind of outperform the other running back by a couple of yards, by maybe about 100 yards. But he was still getting it done, running back by committee here in UNC. Still got it done. All righty. Um, all right, so the getting better every single season. He's proven that he can rush for a thousand yards. That's what we're talking about. Got good uh, kind of uh, touchdowns as well. I mean, he averaged eight yards a carry this season. That's what we're talking about. All righty, and it's we see that he got to two bowl games in 2019 and 2020. So we do like to kind of weigh bowl games heavy. You have a month to prepare. You're facing kind of equal opponent offensively and defensively. So there's no reason why you should flounder, or we don't want to see you flounder. Uh, more like it. So here we go. Bowl game against Temple. They get the win. Fantastic. 18 rushes for 84 yards. No touchdowns. He had one catch for minus two yards, no touchdowns. All righty. How close was this game? Oh, they blew him out. They just blew him out. Okay. Okay. So they didn't need him that much. Um, don't know if that's good or bad. You got to win, so I'll give it to him. 
um, contributing to the win. That's all we want to see. And then 2020, just this season, got to another bowl game against Miami. And oh, oh yeah, this was his best season anyway, 2020. And man, oh man, this bowl game. Oh my goodness. Oh my God. They get the win. 24 carries, 308 yards, 12. 12.8 yards of carry. The man was running for 13 yards. First down, first down, first down. 10, like eight plays, seven plays. You're in a touchdown. No worries. Holy cow. He had two touchdowns to go along with that. Two catches for nine yards. No touchdowns, but he got it done on the ground. Holy cow. Well done. Well done. How close was this game? Was this a blow? It was a blow. They just kept running and running and running, not caring. Blowing out Miami, Florida, 62 to 26 in the bowl game. And thanks to in part by our running back here, Michael Carter. All righty. Well, he won me over in that bowl game. I don't care. What have you done for us lately? I'm ready to draft this man right now. Gosh darn. Woof. All righty. So the stats are there. Sats are there for this season. Now let's go to the highlights. We get a nine-minute highlight package here. We'll see if we have to watch this entire thing or if we're kind of, you know, feeling them, you know, midway through. But let's see where this takes us. The stats of 2020 were fantastic. Great in the bowl game. Fantastic all around. Let's see how this man's working in the film. So here we go. Michael Carter running back from North Carolina. What's his number? Number three and eight if we have to follow him around. So here we go. <clears throat> First play. Running, taking his time, being patient, finds the hole, and then goes and exploits it. Okay, okay. I'm a little concerned on this first play already. He's not looking fast, or his kind of quick cuts, his acceleration's not there. But here we go. Okay, he's running by everybody in Syracuse. No finishing speed so far. All righty. He doesn't have great speed so far. That's a little lackluster. Little screen here on the next play. Once again, it's against Syracuse. Just running all the way to the left side of the field and just can't quite get it. He's looking slow out there. He's not looking quick. He's not looking quick. Okay. All right, here we go. Next up against Boston College. Let's see if he looks a little faster here. All right, here we go. Hitting the edge. Going on the sideline for about 25 yards there. Picks up the first. Okay, here we go. Right up the middle. All righty. Can he beat him? Can't really shake the safety that much. No, no great game ba breaking speed. This man does not have game breaking speed like Travis Etienne or Najee Harris does. So definitely got to be kind of you know a second tier running back taken here. Here we go. Stays on his feet towards the sideline, but no explosive runs. He doesn't look fast out there. It's kind of throwing me off a little bit. He does not look quick out there. Safety brings him down four yards of short of the for, of the touchdown. Unfortunately, couldn't quite stay on his feet there. Running right up the middle. Okay, gets 10 yards, 15 yards. Mm, I was a little bit more impressed on the stats in the bowl game, I think. <laughs> All right, here we go. Racing to the left side, but he can't He can't really outrun anybody right here. Where's 23 coming from? Is that man coming from the line? Where's that man coming from? No, linebacker on the left side, though. Left side linebacker running, or right side linebacker running all the way to the left side, chasing down the running back. Not great. All righty. Damn, I want to get jazzed on this man. Here we go. Cutting back inside. This works, but it's like 15 yards. Good blocking. No elite speed, man. That's a little disappointing. Got to mark it. We're seeing it way too much here. Yeah. All righty. Damn. If you don't got speed as a running back, you know, what do we really got? If you're not Derrick Henry and you don't got speed, uh, it's solid. It's solid. It's running back by committee, and maybe you know the other running back is a little bit better that they have. Here we go. All righty. Running behind Virginia Tech. He's able to take this one for the go. Let's see. This one's about 60 yards. He just does not look fast out there. I don't know what it is. Looks like he's jogging, but it's got to be a full sprint since he's beating everybody here, but... Alrighty, let's keep it going here. Let's see if he wins us over any. Alright, here we go. Beating him to the corner. His acceleration doesn't look that good either. He's getting touchdowns. I guess I give it to him, but... Mm. Just the eye test. It's not looking good to me. It's not looking great. It's not looking like with the uh, those other running backs that we've seen so far in our draft countdown. Alrighty, maybe nine minutes was a little too much for a highlight package for this man. Let's cut it down to like four minutes and see some nice runs here. 
breaking it all the way to the outside, can't really break any tackles, getting caught, you know, from behind a little bit, can't outrun that last line of defense, can't really challenge anybody to the corner, stays on his feet here a little bit, picks up nine yards. Going to catch this one. All right, let's see what he's doing in the passing game. Here we go. Nice little wheel route. And he's able to get beyond the defense here. All righty. So he's looking a little bit. Why does he look way faster without the ball? Man, oh, man. He was flying here on this route. All righty. All righty. Maybe we can use this man, you know, uh, catching the ball out of the backfield a little bit more. Back to running the ball here. Nice little hit that he stayed on his feet for. I'm about it. All right, running all the way back to the right side here. Once again, just can't kind of squeeze in and out of these kind of these tight tackle situations and break off. Like, we've seen this. I, I, I'm not speaking out of my gourd here. Like, we've seen other running backs do it. So that's why we're comparing that all to this man. So definitely can't be the number one running back taken. Uh, so we got to squash those dreams right there. Definitely wouldn't even say this man goes in the first round, honestly. I don't know if this is a first round pick. I mean, we know running backs, you know, aren't supposed to be taken in the first round, which is stupid. Go and get the player that you want. Get the best player. Don't care running back position I do not care uh but classic rules I I wouldn't expect this man to get taken in the first round I mean like I'm seeing nothing great out of this man that's not great at running back I mean we know they're a diamond does and we know that you know teams don't like paying the running backs and you know I mean uh, you know they're running back by committee I mean there's really no team that just has one solid running back unlike if you're Derrick Henry this man's not Derrick Henry so um, running back by committee I mean this is what this man's probably his future is Travis Etienne, Najee Harris, they could be, you know, single running backs, I think. They can kind of do what Derrick Henry does. Travis Etienne has the sheer speed, and Najee Harris has the size and the speed and the catchability all mixed into one. Here we go. Nice on the, you know, nice little 10-yard run. Great blocking. Definitely helps him. Doesn't need to be too fast down here in the red zone in the goal-to-go -go situations. All righty. I'm about to skip forward to this bowl game, honestly. Hopefully they have this bowl game in here because I'm a little uh, I'm a little disappointed in this man so far, and I kind of want to get back on this man. So let's find out who this bowl game this year was against. Hopefully they have this in the highlight package. That would be truly disappointing if it doesn't. Um, all right, so that bowl game was against Miami, Florida. All righty, let's try and skip around. Let's see if they got the game against Miami, Florida here. Let's watch some of these Notre Dame highlights. This is the number two ranked Notre Dame team. We know they sucked in the playoffs. <laughs> we know they sucked in their last game of the season, and they shouldn't have gotten into the playoffs, and then they sucked in the playoffs. Uh, but let's see how this man's working here against Notre Dame. Third quarter, down seven. Let's see what this man can do. On the 20-yard line, his own 20-yard line, going up the middle. Yeah, it's no, it's no real great shift ability, no great speed. It's solid. It's all solid work out here. We're not trying to put this man down too much, but... Nothing elite from this man. I'm not seeing anything elite from this man. All right, here we go against Florida. Here we go. We're getting some highlights here. All righty. All righty. All righty. This is the big one. This is the game where he destroyed it. Let's make sure this is the first meeting, too. I hope, I hope they didn't play twice, right? They did not play twice. All righty. All righty. This should be the game right here. All righty. Let's see what this man can do here against Florida. The best game he's ever had. First run. Here we go. Getting out to the outside, stay, once again, just 10 yards, all that for 10 yards, it's good, 10 yards is great, it's good, don't get us wrong, here we go in the red zone here, catching the ball over the middle of the field, 10 yards, he's a 10 yard man, whatever he does, doesn't matter if he's going all the way from the left side to the right side, doesn't matter if he's breaking all these tackles, he's solidified at 10 yards, he can't get anything more, can't get anything less <laughs> at all his effort here, alright, here we go, able to kind of break the speed here, there we go. Once again, this is a nice little six-yard run. We've seen one of these before. We were able to kind of start at the middle, break it out to the outside, and then just beat everybody. But that doesn't look fast to me. He's only 5'8", so maybe that's playing into it a little bit. I mean, Derrick Henry doesn't look fast to me, but that we know that man's fast. He literally can outrun everybody. But I don't think this man's having this problem. <laughs> All righty. Here we go. Shiftiness a little bit. Once again, 10 yards, 10 yards. He's the 10-yard king, folks. If you need 10 yards, you go to this man. Here we go. <laughs> Uh, all right, once again, a little shiftiness. 
He's able to beat all the defenders. These are bad defenders here. If you're going to think about drafting a defender from Miami, Florida, no, 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 no. Do not do that. They're trash. They can't even bring down Michael Carter here. All righty. What else do we get? Just absolutely destroying Miami here. All righty. Here we go. Up the middle. I... I it's sol it's solid. He's not beating anybody. He's not beating anybody's sheer speed. His athleticism, his jukes in and out, his quick cuts are not beating anybody. His acceleration after the cuts is not game-breaking. So you can kind of recover on this man decently if he beats you, if he burns you at the line or you know makes you take that step in when you should have taken the step out. All right, here we go. Now this is the speed we're talking about. But once again, he gets brought down. I mean, this is open field right up the middle. But these two safeties on the left and right side are converging down, so he, he does not have game-breaking speed. And for that, I think we have to cut this highlight package a little short here. And for that reason, he can't be one of these top running backs taken. So we gave the man a chance. The stats were looking good, but we had to look at this man with the film too, and I wasn't really buying him on the film. I didn't really see anything fantastic, anything great, anything really draft-worthy. It's not like I have to go out and draft this man right now. So... Alrighty, we haven't really been disappointed too many times in our draft prospect countdown, but I'm a little disappointed. Thought we were going to get something better. So, Ugh, it's not great if you're not impressing me. <laughs> I'll say that. Um, Alrighty, Michael Carter. That's him. 5'8", running back. Solid. Solid. Number two running back, I would say. Alrighty, uh, that's going to do it for us today. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for listening. Let's see if anything has broken since we've been live. Anything going on here? Anything going on here? Let's see. Hey, Ryan Tannehill getting in on the Derrick Henry workout. I love it. And look at this man struggling, man. I know, you know, Derrick Henry's an absolute freak of an athlete. I mean, this is what I would be doing as well. Oh, she's bringing the chair. <laughs> Yo, I love this. Yeah, I love this. Uh, Der uh, Ryan Tannehill's wife, because <laughs> we saw Derrick Henry have chains on his neck. She goes and gets kind of a chain purse and puts it around his neck. Oh, I love it. Ryan Tannehill, man. What a good dude. What a good dude. I, I, I'm a little upset it didn't work out for him in Miami, but what a great guy right here. And look at this. Like his arms, he's shaking. Derrick Henry shook zero on those push-ups that we just saw. The man's a beast, folks. Come on. That's fantastic, though. I love this. I love this video. <laughs> we'll talk about that more probably tomorrow on the show. Um. Oh, what did we forget to do today? What did we forget to do today, folks? We got to check in on Michael Strahan. How's those chompers looking? Michael, does he even have... It's He's got Twitter, right? Michael Strahan. All right, here we go. What do we get? He hasn't posted anything about the tooth. We still got a couple hours... <laughs> I still got a couple hours left to call bogus on it. But um, it's, a, it's, it's 147 here Eastern. Our camera just died, unfortunately. That's how you know we're going a little bit too late. Um, all righty, so... We're going to be back tomorrow. I think we survived. Um, I think we have survived April Fool's Day. We did not get got, I don't think, at all today. Alrighty, so we'll have, um, we'll, we'll know tomorrow if those chompers of uh, Michael Strahan are legit or not. But we haven't seen anything yet. And I think, I think we would have seen something in the morning, don't you think? Interesting. Maybe he's right. Maybe he really did it. Respect if you really did it. Alrighty. We're out of here today. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for watching. We're back tomorrow live noon Eastern. We're out.